Hello, this is Jed Brewer with Study Groups and the Below the Line Club. Thanks for being on the call today. Uh, webinar number three in our, our series on COVID-19. Uh, a lot has changed in the last week, uh, and really it feels like every day is about a week in time, I'm sure, for most people on the call. Uh, but last Friday, uh, the CARES Act came out, and that's one piece of, uh, I guess, legal information that we need to know about and how it applies to us and then there's also other legal considerations that I think we as marketers need to keep in mind. So really pleased to have uh, three panelists on the call today. Uh, the first person is going to be Ben Clausen who's an attorney at Winthrop and Weinstein. They're out of St. Paul, Minnesota and do a lot of work um, in this industry but work across many different industries and Ben um, is on the team there at Winthrop, and really he's been tasked in this uh, law firm of many attorneys to be the expert on certain pieces of this CARES Act that, uh, that's come out. So it'd be very interesting to, to have him share his perspective on the CARES Act and how it applies to our businesses and uh, address some questions. And then after that, we'll have uh, two study group members. Uh, who are attorneys for their respective uh, petroleum marketing companies. Uh, one would be Daniel Pazanski, who's the uh, attorney for U.S. Venture out of Appleton, Wisconsin. And two would be Tate Seidman, who's an attorney for Fike Wholesale out of Temple, Texas. And Dan is going to talk a little bit about force majeure and supply contracts. And uh, Tate will speak a little bit on franchise agreements and uh, landlord-tenant uh, legal issues that we may need to keep in mind and um, this, this whole new landscape that, that we're working in today. So we'll start with, with Ben. And I have everybody muted. I would encourage you to um, uh, ask any questions that you may have, but type it into the uh, GoToWebinar system that we have. Uh, I'll try to read those questions and then relay them as best as we can to to the audience member, and I know some people have already sent in questions, so we'll um, uh, try to address those as we go too. And uh, I will say um, we'll make this uh, recording uh, available to everybody afterwards should you want to share it with a, a friend or a colleague and, um, and some other resources as it goes along. So again, thank you for being on the call today. Ben Clausen with uh, Winthrop. Ben, let me um, turn the floor over to you to share with us just uh, a, a little bit about the, the CARES Act from a high level. Sure. Thanks so much, Chad. Uh, the, the CARES Act is something we've been studying for a little bit before it was passed last week, Friday. Um, and the Paycheck, program, Paycheck Protection Program in particular is a really uh, valuable resource for, for a lot of businesses in the current climate. Um, I'm going to start by giving a little bit of a status update on where things stand for uh, businesses as they prepare to apply for funds, um, and then give a little bit kind of overview of the, the general terms of the act, as I'm sure there's been a lot of media attention, and I know a lot of companies have already been preparing the applications. Uh, so first, the, uh, the kind of current status. Uh, yesterday, the Treasury Department issued uh, what has been described as guidance regarding the the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, it was really limited information that did not flesh out what we kind of expect to see as far as final rules interpreting this really significant piece of legislation. Uh, but the Treasury did note that applications are going to be accepted starting April 3rd for small businesses. And then independent contractors and sole proprietors can also obtain uh, these loans. And there's a kind of a delayed application date for independent contractors of April 10th. Uh, so things have been moving really quickly. And, you know, this, this was passed into law last week, Friday. And, uh, and now we're, uh, we've been hearing from lenders that we've been talking to about this, that the SBA has been communicating that they hope to have the final rules out sometime today. Uh, so we have the outside chance that the, uh, that this, this uh, legislation could be fleshed out, you know, while we're on the call or, or sometime later today. And then uh, there will be additional analysis and, uh, you know, in detail on exactly how these, these rules play in. Um, at the same time, this is such a valuable program that lenders are really expecting to have extremely high volume. So we've been advising clients that uh, you can be working on your application right away. 
uh, with an expectation that you can submit it in advance of April 3rd and then hopefully can get yourself kind of first in line for funds once they're authorized to be dispersed. Um, and the the uh, process is going to be a uh, this is going to be very difficult on banks to administer. For context, in 2019, there were about $29 billion of total SBA loan lending activity, and the Paycheck Protection Program is $349 billion of funds. So it's over 10 times as large as the entire volume of SBA activity during 2019. And as I'm sure everyone knows, it's a, it's a big lending activity. So uh, there's going to be a lot of burden on our bankers, um, and people aren't generally uh, terribly sympathetic for to bankers, but um, you know they're they're going to be working extremely hard as they administer this program. And so our view has been that uh, as you look at the rules and as you look at the application to try to get as much of this completed accurately as you can, and make it easy for your bank to uh, to process your application and hopefully um, get funding quickly. So uh, that's kind of the current status. Just a little bit on the high level of details on what this what this program means. So the loans are Section 7A SBA loans, uh, but they're, they're special loans that are exempt from a number of requirements that are generally limiting to a number of businesses to obtain funding. Um, the the kind of headline ones are uh, ordinarily there's, there's tests for small business concerns that are based on number of employees and revenue limits uh, in specific industries. Uh, but the SBA will expand this program to employers with uh, 500 or fewer employees. Um, there are complicated affiliation rules that will apply in general, uh, except for many people on this call uh, may be exempted from those attribution rules because um, there's three categories of companies that would not be subject to affiliation. Uh, the first are uh, NAICS Code 72 hotels and restaurants. Uh, the second is registered French SBA registered franchises, uh, and so large large groups of franchisees do not have to uh, do the math on on whether there are other affiliated entities that would be included along with an applicant for purposes of the 500 employee limit. And then the uh, the third category of exempted entities is the, our small business investment companies. Uh, or I guess companies that have received investment from small business investment companies. Uh, ben, so uh, the question, go ahead. Question from uh, which I think is a good point that you mentioned here is they've really expanded the definition of what a small business is for the purposes of this loan, and and I know the the original SBA Section 7A or whatever was that you let's call it revenue had to be less than seven million or somewhere in that ballpark to qualify for it. But that is now off the table, which applies to most of our companies where we're few in number of employees, but because we do a lot of sales at a very low margin, our, our revenue tends to be pretty high. So in the past, we wouldn't have been able to qualify for an SBA loan, even though we likely don't have 500 employees. But, but what you're saying is it's really the 500 employees that matters now, not where your revenue is. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And and uh, yeah, as you pointed out, it's going to expand eligibility to a large number of companies that would not traditionally have been able to get SBA financing. And then a, a question that I've heard from some others is, all right, I've got different companies that are all under either a management company or common ownership, and the individual companies are under 500 employees, but my company as a whole may be um, over 500 do I qualify then? What, what happens in, in that case, the aggregation? Yeah, so uh, ordinarily, unless there's an exemption from the uh, attribution or affiliation rules, then, uh, you know, without, there's, there are, you know, specifics on the test, but in general, uh, subsidiaries of a, of a holding company would all be considered affiliates, and then the SBA would count all of the employees for the entire control group of companies as if it were a single business concern that were making the application. So if there were 10 companies with 100 employees each, the SBA would, would deem there to be 1,000 employees and, and, and those, the, the business concern would, be, would not be eligible for, for the loans. Uh, that's where I think it's really helpful for uh, the franchise exemption 
uh, where, uh, where SBA registered franchises do not need to do this affiliation calculation. And so each one of the, uh, one of the companies that was part of this broader group of, of companies would each be eligible to, to apply for, for a loan. Mm -hmm. And an example of that could be like Hilton, right? The, the hotel industry has been damaged very dramatically. And so the Congress wanted to be able to allow these hotels uh, to, to be able to have access to some of these loans, um, just as an example. Uh, is, is that correct? Where Hilton as an entity is very large, much more than uh, 500 employees, but each individual hotel would be less than 500. So, so they're sort of carved out as one of these attributes. Yeah, there's like, hotels and restaurants get a little bit of special treatment um, as far as their exception, but there's a there's a separate exemption for registered franchises um, that could apply in you know a number of industries. And in general, you think that franchises have you know a typical franchise or franchisee has a number of different locations, and uh, and so you know the the way the affiliation rules work, it's possible that you know, there would be aggregation for entities that really, really, uh, you know, wouldn't be suitable. So it's it's just in general, it's a way for uh, that. I think these networks of, of franchisees could be eligible for, for for these loans when they would not otherwise have been been able to obtain funding. OK, thank you. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, there's there's more detail as far as eligible entities, but um, this is the, one of the reasons that there's so much interest in this program is is because it's been expanded to a broad group of of uh, of companies. The the uh, the other important feature um, as far as uh, as far as eligible companies is that uh, for typical SBA funding, there would be a, a requirement that there's no funding elsewhere uh, available to the borrower, and and those rules are waived. Uh, for purposes of these loans, and then there also is no collateral requirements and no personal guarantee, um, which is which is uh, you know extremely limiting and I think would take additional time. Plus, if if there are companies that have other other lenders, you know we're we're going to have to obtain these loans quickly, and you know you won't have to worry about subordinating to other subordinating this debt to your your primary lender. Um, I would still advise borrowers to at least look at their loan agreements or, or speak with their lender if they're going to be obtaining a loan from another source. Um, but these loans are so attractive to borrowers that it'd be generated, you know, and most most lenders are taking the position that it's uh, this is a positive for for borrowers to obtain funding to, uh, you know, to ensure that the, um, the businesses are in good shape going forward and improve the, the security of the primary lender. Um, we haven't even talked about just the, the biggest feature of these loans and why they've gotten so much attention is that they're they're forgivable. Uh, when the uh, assuming that the the loan amounts are used for qualified purposes, then the borrower will not be uh, expected to to pay the loans back, and that loan loan forgiveness is actually excluded from gross income for the borrower. So it's almost a net grant of funding. Um, the kind of the key terms on how much you can borrow the the maximum eligible amount is two and a half times your average monthly payroll uh, that amount is calculated based on the prior 12 month period uh, so you would look at the uh, the amount of payroll costs that are included in your uh, included for each payroll period and then uh, identify the average and you can borrow up to two and a half times that amount up to ten million dollars um, and we uh, don't plan to go into great detail on the kind of the other uh, big loan program that's been uh, launched re recently, the EIDL or Disaster Loan Program. Uh, but if anyone has been obtaining has obtained a disaster loan, the Paycheck Protection Program permits a borrower to refinance that amount and uh, and and convert the borrowed amount into a Paycheck Protection Program loan. Um, and that's that's a way to kind of take your disaster loan and then be able to obtain forgiveness on that amount. And so the amount that you'd be eligible to, to borrow would be two and a half times your payroll payroll costs plus the amount of the disaster loan that was refinanced. Uh, once you've obtained funding, on, 
Uh, just a question on, on the amount that you can receive. You say it's uh, the lesser of two and a half times average monthly payroll over the past 12 months or $10 million, which, whichever is lesser than that. Um, often the binding one would be the two and a half times monthly payroll. And, and payroll is wages, commissions, health insurance, retirement, state and local taxes. Uh, it's kind of a baked in, all in number. A lot of our uh, marketers and retailers, they use independent contractors. Are they able to take the monies that they pay to independent contractors and count that under this payroll number, or is it just employees? Independent contractors are eligible to be included in payroll costs. Um, and as you mentioned, the, the amount that you can include in payroll costs includes benefits and commission or um, and also payroll taxes that are assessed. Um, but for each employee or independent contractor, there's a $100,000 cap on the amount of compensation that can be included in the payroll costs. Uh, this has been kind of an area of confusion and it, it, the definitions were changing uh, in the different drafts of legislation that were, uh, were proposed by in the House and Senate during, during the negotiation of this bill. Um, but the the way it, the way it shook out is you can you can include the compensation up to a hundred thousand. So if if there is an employer independent contractor who earned in excess of one hundred thousand, then uh, you just include that individual uh, as one hundred thousand on an annual basis for purposes of calculating your payroll costs. Makes sense. Uh, yeah, we can, thank you. Yeah, and, and we can include, we can discuss a little bit if we have time on, you know, what, what type of information you can be gathering uh, to get your application ready. Uh, but just kind of touching on that as we've been discussing payroll costs, the, uh, the, the CARES Act doesn't actually say how you can prove what your payroll costs are. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, in general, the SBA has been looking for 1099s or W-2s. Uh, and there's also a reference to a, uh, inclusion of, uh, of evidence that payroll taxes have been paid. Um, so look back and, and consider, you know, the, what, what filings have been out there and, and good ways to, uh, to prove the, the amount of payroll costs that have been incurred. Um, and just one point on, uh, was something to keep an eye on, because I know a lot of borrowers are trying to get their, their uh, documentation in order. There's been some speculation about what this period is going to be for determining what your average payroll costs are. Um, and so we're an eagerly anticipating what the regulations say in, in final, but um, it may it may actually be based on the, the 2019 calendar year, um, which would be a lot easier for a lot of companies to, to demonstrate what their payroll costs are. Uh, and, and just considering the, the huge volume of, of loans that are going to be taken out, that uh, that might ultimately be what, what the SBA prefers. So I'd keep an eye on what the actual period is in which you're able to to demonstrate those costs. And, and there may be a reason to look at the 12 months, uh, you know, more recently concluded if your payroll costs were higher and that would increase the amount that you could borrow. Uh, so then moving on to kind of the, the use of funds and the forgiveness component, uh, the, the amount that the, the, loan, the loan proceeds can be used for payroll costs as we've, we've just discussed, but also on rent, mortgage interest, and utility expenses. And the, these, these costs, and it's, it's important for the forgiveness component to think about from a timing perspective that uh, those costs would be totaled for the eight weeks after loan disbursement. Um, so for a lot, of, a lot of companies are looking at this and considering you know, how, how uh, to most appropriately staff their businesses and considering that you, you really would like to have your payroll costs be, be uh, at, a, at, a, at a good level during the eight weeks after the loan has been dispersed. Um, and another component to think about for that is, uh, is rents. And a lot of businesses have been working with their landlords on potentially deferring rents or coming up with other arrangements. Um, it may be in, a, in a, uh, a borrower's best interest to be paying full rent during the eight weeks following disbursement of this loan because you can obtain forgiveness for the, the rent portion. Uh, and if your loan payments are deferred until after the eight weeks is, period is concluded, then, uh, then perhaps you're not entitled to forgiveness on that sum. Uh, one additional component on the, 
the uh, the forgiveness and and the whole purpose of this program is to keep the relationship between employers and their employees or independent contractors strong. So there's a there's a requirement that the the borrower maintain their full time employee counts to be consistent with prior levels. Uh, there's a provision that would reduce your eligibility for forgiveness on a proportionate basis with any reduction in your employee count. Um, helpfully, you can you can use your the baseline number of your employees uh, for the prior period can be calculated from either of February 15th through June 30th of 2019, or at, at the borrower's election, you can choose to look at your baseline for the period for the first two months of 2020. Um, when you're when you're selecting the the number of employees for those two periods, um, you should it would be in your interest to actually come up with the lower of those two numbers uh, because you'll be comparing your current number of employees over this eight week period against the number of employees that you had in the prior the prior period. So it'd be easier to satisfy and obtain full forgiveness if you're using a lower number as a baseline. Um, and then kind of the nitty gritty of calculating this without getting into too much detail, but to calculate the number of employees during those periods, look at the the uh, each each payroll each payroll period you would count the number of employees, including full and part time employees during that time. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. Sorry, this for the purposes of the forgiveness, it would just be full time employees. Um, but the uh, calculate the number of of employees for that period, and then uh, for that payroll period, and then determine the the average based on the number of payroll periods in the in the apl applicable measuring time. Um, there's also one other one other way in which uh, loan forgiveness could be reduced, and that's if the compensation of any employee or independent contractor who earned less than $100,000 annually, uh, if that person's compensation were reduced by more than 25%, then the extent of a reduction beyond 25% would be would uh, count against your eligible forgiveness on a dollar for dollar basis. So, for example, if an employee that made $75,000 annually in compensation had their had their uh, their amount of compensation reduced by 33%. Well, then the amount that would be included to reduce your forgiveness eligibility would be 8%, or the difference between the 33% reduction and kind of a 25% threshold on on reduction in total compensation. Uh, and then you know, looking at that another way, a a business could reduce total compensation for each employee by 25% across the board without affecting eligibility for forgiveness. Um, and then the so last let's break kind that of, down. Let's break that down real quick because I think those are important points where the forgiveness could be less than full. Um, and one that you mentioned was you need to maintain your same full-time equivalent employees and there's two separate measurement periods that you can use at your election. Now, and one being January through February, and one was looking back to some six month period in 2019 of how many people were on your team, full time equivalents. Now, what if I saw a downturn in my volumes or in my business, and before this act came out, I made the tough decision to lay off people? So I've already laid off people, um, and that's just a recent decision. What, what options do I have in that case? Yeah, there's a rehire uh, provision under under the legislation that would allow an employer who had who had uh, reduced their full time employee count between February 15th and April uh, um, and April 26th to uh, to rehire employees and bring your full time employee count back up to prior levels by June 30th. Um, this is something that does need to get fleshed out a little bit in the in the rules. It's unclear whether an employer could, you know, rehire all of their employees uh, on June 29th and then uh, and then qualify for full full forgiveness. Of course, you would still need to uh, have enough qualified expenses during the eight-week period following disbursement. But uh, but there is a rehire provision, and the same thing applies to the level of compensation. If any if any employees or contractors had had uh, experienced reduced compensation beyond 25% during uh, prior periods, then those those reductions could be re reduced or reversed by June 30th, and it would allow a borrower to get full forgiveness on the loans. 
which is getting back to that intent of paycheck protection, um, uh, trying to help us prevent needing to cut people's salaries or help us prevent needing to uh, lay people off, so an, an opportunity to rehire or restore wages. Yeah, when you look forward, and hopefully, you know, it, it's tough to it's tough to forecast in the current environment, but um, our, our hope is that by the end of June that uh, things will have improved and, and business will be running more, uh, more, more similar to as it usually has been or it had been in the past. Um, and so maybe at that time it's appropriate that employers would be bringing back full-time employee accounts and, and bringing people back from furlough. So hopefully this, uh, this program works in tandem uh, with, uh, with kind of the needs of businesses. Um, one, one thing we have been looking at with as different clients, um, well, and Jed, and Jed I'll, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll stop for, for any additional questions you have, because I, I think the kind of the transition, if you'd like me to speak a little bit on the unemployment uh, piece and how that how that plays into the Paycheck Protection Program analysis. Yeah, let, let's hit a couple questions, because uh, I think this forgiveness is a, a major reason why somebody would want to um, um, do this Paycheck Protection Program. So one of the things I heard you say is the forgiveness is income is not income taxable. So if you got that loan forgiven at some day, you don't need to pay income tax, which is a big benefit. Give us a sense how the loan is actually deferred and then how it's ultimately forgiven, like how long until you can actually get your money back. Um, my understanding is you have to pay interest on this loan for whatever period of time that is. And, and you mentioned a couple ways that I know if I can qualify to, to get that money back, but I just wouldn't want somebody entering this and thinking they were going to get their loan forgiven and then, and then not. And you mentioned a couple criteria, but, but what about the duration? When would I get my money, money back or have it be forgiven? Yeah, this is an, it's an interesting question. Uh, and banks, uh, we work with a number of, of banks and other financial, financial institutions that could be making these loans. And, you know, there, this is, this has all happened in less than a week. So, um, the, the kind of procedures and it's, it's very important to lenders and, and borrowers should be aware too. Um, the, uh, the loan proceeds should be distributed in, we anticipate that the loan proceeds would all kind of be distributed in a lump sum as opposed to a uh, kind of a line of credit scenario. And the, uh, really the forgiveness uh, won't, won't necessarily impact the borrower at the time the loan is forgiven. The, the lender will be obtaining a 100% uh, – will, will be obtaining payment on their the guaranteed portion by the SBA. So the – the SBA is going to make payments to the bank to re reimburse them for the amounts of the loans. Um, the time frame for banks getting reimbursed is um, is relatively uh, – there, there's some long time frames for banks, and there's also some kind of language in the act that would allow banks to uh, report their for expected forgiveness amounts to the SBA and then potentially receive payments in 15 days on the expected forgiveness. Um, this is one other area that – we would like some guidance from from the SBA and their rules. This isn't this isn't a procedure that would ordinarily be used for Section 7A loans. Um, but kind of thinking this through from a lender's perspective, and then as a borrower, you know, with with as, with as much volume, if you want to make this easy for your lender, they may be asking for evidence to show what you think that your expenditure will be on payroll costs, rent, mortgage, and utilities um, at the time that you take out the loan. Um, I know we've seen some kind of document document lists that that banks have sent around and, and said what what borrowers can start to collect, um, and you know those would include um, amounts to show what you're paying in rent and mortgage interest and utilities, um, so that the the lenders are able to to turn around make those reports to the SBA and then uh, get get funding back because the sheer volume of loans here is could cause a liquidity problem at a number of lenders and. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that there's funding enough for everyone because, you know, these, these funds are really going to be supporting a number of businesses and, and uh, you know, helping, helping out the economy overall. Okay. So uh, j just on, on when I could expect to get the money um, forgiven, there's not really a clear 
timeline on when that would be, like one year from the date of origination or something where I get the, I don't need to pay this money back. Well, the, yeah, it's if you're waiting for a confirmation that, in fact, you are eligible for forgiveness, uh, the SBA is, yeah. is required to make a determination within 60 days after receiving a report. Okay. So at some point, I'll issue a report, and I'll be paying interest at that full time until I get that confirmation, I would assume. We think that there will be interest. Uh, it's not um, during the during the first eight weeks. It's possible that the, that there won't be interest during the initial period. Um, if you look at the legislation, it said that uh, the interest rate would be capped at 4% and that the loan term would be 10 years. Uh, but the information that was issued by Treasury yesterday said that the loan term would be two years and that there would be a half percent interest assessed. Um, uh, the general thinking is in the, the communications we've had with lenders is they they're, they're not particularly interested in making loans to borrowers who will not have the loan forgiven. Um, half percent interest really isn't enough for, uh, for the loans to be worthwhile for a bank. Um, so I think the more that a borrower can, can show that they will in fact be able to use up all of the borrowed funds and obtain forgiveness on it, the better. Yeah. Well, that, that's good because I, I think the forgiveness would be a big reason why a lot of people would want to, businesses would want to undertake it. Are there any other catches to it that we need to keep in mind? Like I read something somewhere, and I don't know if I was reading the right thing, but uh, something about owner distributions that during a period of time, um, you, you shouldn't be able to take owner distributions. Does that apply to the PPP or is that something else? Because um, that could be an important um, carve yeah. out that most, most of our businesses need distributions to pay income taxes or principal on debt that they have outside the company or something like that. Yeah, not a, not expressly in the same way where you talk about a you know a express prohibition on any funds being being uh, withdrawn from the business. Uh, there is in the there's a, a separate 500 billion dollar stabilization fund that uh, Treasury Department will be administering. Um, and there, those details have kind of been overlooked. I mean, this, there's going to be businesses between 500 and 10,000 employees who are going to be eligible for loans under that program under very favorable terms. Um, and they, 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 those will have some of the hooks that you mentioned about disbursements. What the Paycheck Protection Program says is that a borrower must use the funds, and you're going to be required to certify that you will use the funds only for eligible purposes. And those are kind of the four key buckets that we mentioned earlier, the payroll costs, rents, mortgage interest, and utilities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Somebody has a specific question as it comes to the franchise. Um, um, I, I can't remember what you call them, affiliation uh, that you talked about earlier. One person just says, um, I see that Wendy's is a registered franchise. And so if we have convenience stores with a total of over 500 employees, so company in total is too big, but Wendy's in a separate entity with less than 500 employees, even though they're affiliated companies, could they, the Wendy's part of their company still qualify? Yeah, the Wendy's, the Wendy's group would, uh, would qualify then. Um, and so the, the, the number, assuming that, you know, the, the other tests are met, but for, for Wendy's being a restaurant, you know, the, it, it's a lot easier for them to qualify for the loan because the 500 employee limit applies on a per store basis. So that's so mm -hmm. under that fact pattern, assuming that the service station is not a registered franchise, um, then the uh, then the Wendy's the Wendy's aspect would be eligible for a loan, but the service station would not. Okay, and then. Layoffs, we talked about that being we, we don't want layoffs. That's kind of the, the purpose. And so you need to maintain um, your full-time equivalents or some large percentage of it. Are there any conditions when layoffs would be allowed, like, you know, your sales dropped to 10 percent of what they were, you know, prior to this because you were effectively, you know, shut down as a result of it? No, it, it, the, it, you know, maybe we'll see a little bit of more detail on that in the rules. Um, we can be a little bit sensitive to, to companies because the, the, there might not be layoffs at all. I mean, if you read the, the CARES Act, you could have employees voluntarily terminate. And as long as the, 
the borrower's full-time employee count had reduced, then the eligibility forgiveness is going to be reduced accordingly. The loan terms are still are still good enough that I would advise somebody to try to obtain a loan even if they didn't believe they could obtain full forgiveness. I don't think we mentioned even that um, that the principal and interest payments of principal and interest on the loans are deferred for six months. So it's it's possible that a a borrower could be could could obtain full forgiveness for the loan and then um, and then yeah we'll have to see whether they even whether there even would be any interest uh, assessed during the first eight week period and if it were at half percent per year it's going to be a, a negligible amount would actually have to be paid back. Okay. And then you talked about the one hundred thousand dollar limit um, uh, on on somebody's compensation. That includes, I would assume, any benefits. Um, so it's like a fully grossed up one hundred thousand dollars. That's how we've been reading it. It's not um, terribly clear in the way it was written in the CARES Act. They use the term salary and, comp uh, and compensation in in the same section that that kind of would, I think, is, is caused this question to come up for a number of people. But if you look at the fact sheet that Treasury uh, distributed yesterday, um, they refer it to it to the, the $100,000 cap as a cap on total compensation or total payroll costs, which would mean that uh, you would add up, you would include the benefits and, and payroll taxes when you're, when you're considering the $100,000 limit. Okay. And, and then this whole independent contractor thing, it's very um, uh, vague on who is an independent contractor, who isn't. Is it anybody that we issue a 1099 to? So could that be like service contractors and, and vendors that would qualify as well? Yeah, 1099s are, uh, I think, more clearly eligible for this. Um, the, the independent contractor piece is very interesting. Uh, it's not previously defined in the in SBA rules, but the uh, if you look at the way the IRS would define an independent contractor, you could include really larger um, larger subcontractors who in turn have their own contractors. Um, so there is some question about uh, you know if you take if you take the analysis to uh, you know the full uh, look at it you know in, in in a situation where you have a kind of a general contractor subcontractors and then maybe 1099s that are employed by a subcontractor, um, arguably each one of the, the parties in that group would be independently eligible for a forgivable loan. But uh, you know, really it's the same money that's flowed down um, through multiple levels. So that's kind of one thing that we're looking at to, to get a little bit of clarity on and, and how uh, eligibility will be determined. Um, and there's been some attention about how you know, independent contractors or so-called kind of gig economy workers would be in, would be eligible to get the loans themselves. Um, but uh, we just expect that there's going to be some some limit for for individuals like that, where uh, if their income is not disrupted, that they they may not be eligible for a forgivable loan. But it remains to be seen as we expect to expect guidance. So as soon as we as soon as we obtain rules. On the uh, from the SBA, we'll we'll have to be updating our understanding of the of the program entirely. Um, and unfortunately, if that happens today or early tomorrow, uh, applications are eligible on Friday. It's, it really is a tight timeline to get all of this done. So I I understand why everyone's been looking at it ahead of time without without kind of the benefit of of full guidance to to see how this is going to work. Okay, and then then just a, a quick wrap up here, and then we'll move into the unemployment uh, piece. But you said, you know, where do I get the funds? How do I apply? You said contact your local bank. I think maybe SBA.gov um, can put you in touch with the bank if you don't have a relationship. And when can I start applying? You said April third is when you can do it. And then and the question is, do I need to be like? really prompt like April 3rd I want to have my application in because I'm worried about uh, money drying up is it kind of first come first serve how is this money allocated um, is it needs based or if I put my application in I'm I sh should anticipate getting money G give us a sense there about who ultimately is going to receive the blessing of the of, of this grant or uh, loan I should say 
Well, it, it is it is up to the banks in uh, you know and who who's going to obtain the loans first. I think the the first question is you know should you apply on April third if you have if you're able to get everything together. I think that answer is is clearly yes. I think the application should be submitted as soon as possible, especially if there could be any edits that are are going to be needed before you can sub, before you'd be able to you know complete the the loan application. Um, you know, and and when we're talking to lenders. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of different size banks that are going to be engaged in this activity. Um, if if you're if you have an existing banking relationship, the first thing we've said is to contact your your current banker if, if they are SBA qualified to provide SBA loans. Um, ultimately, the the Treasury has the authority to to authorize lenders who aren't SBA eligible to participate in this program. Um, we haven't seen when when that's going to happen. Uh, but then if you talk to the bankers and, and the volume that they're expecting, um, they're going to be hard pressed to process loans just for their current customers. Um, and they want to make sure that they are you know, able to respond quickly and, and help out these, these businesses and, and obtain what really is a subsidy described as, as disguised as a loan. So, you know, there, there are some, some uh, national lenders that have, uh, that are working on digitizing the application. I know U.S. Bank is working on that, and th there are other big players in this group, uh, you know, that are that are, are going to find ways to uh, to process the number of applications that are coming in. So, it, you know, it is, uh, you know, getting in getting in touch with your lender, you know, even today, even before you know about about the rules, and just kind of getting a maybe being able to manage expectations is a, you know, it's going to be important uh, important piece on this and. <laughs> Like I think I said early on, I really, you know, uh, they're, the, the bankers are going to be working very hard and already have been to respond to uh, and get this program in place. So, um, you know, everything we can do to, to help them, uh, you know, I think is, is, is really going to make the whole program work more smoothly for everybody. Yeah. And I'll just make one comment here. I, I, I found it interesting that, yeah, we're talking about in the case of businesses, but this this program also applies to nonprofits. So if you happen to sit on a board of a of a church or some other charity and uh, your revenues are down and you're thinking of potentially needing to make hard decisions with with the employees, it, this program is available for for those entities too as a possible solution. But but the big idea here is our revenue, our sales are down, and in absence of a subsidy, we would need to. Uh, reduce people's compensation or uh, reduce their hours or um, their their job altogether. So one avenue to approach this is through this uh, loan, this uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Another avenue is is unemployment and just reducing um, uh, some somebody from your organization. And uh, normally uh, that would be a last resort of what somebody would want to do. But give us a sense of some of the unemployment. Uh, enhanced benefits and how in some cases that may actually be a good thing for an, an employee. We generally don't think of unemployment as a good thing, but a comment on that a little bit for us, Ben. Yeah, well, the, the CARES Act greatly expanded unemployment benefits um, in a number of ways. And uh, we've, we're, I'm aware of the changes, but when looking at it, the, uh, the legislation was passed at the federal level uh, and the Department of Labor is going to have to enter into agreements with the individual states to implement these programs. So I'll give a very quick rundown of them. But from our understanding, uh, this, these that individuals are are not currently eligible to obtain um, benefits from the state. But that that could depend. You know, there could be states that have gotten this up and running already. Um, and and currently, unemployment uh, offices are. Are, are swamped. Uh, if you look at the, you know, Minnesota Deeds website, it says really not to bother calling them right now because their their uh, volume is so high and just to submit an application and um, and hope to move quickly. But um, the kind of big picture, the the big ticket items that were included in the CARES Act for unemployment perspective, uh, there's a, a general $600 benefit um, that would be added on top of what the employee or independent contractor would be ordinarily eligible under the state law. Um, and it's that's the flat rate across the board. So this has gotten some attention because if you do the math, depending on the state and the level of compensation, particularly uh, employees with lower compensation levels, it may be in the it, the employee may be eligible for more compensation on un unemployment than they would be in, at work. 
Um, and this, this plays into your analysis for the Paycheck Protection Program because if employees are placed on furlough or terminated and, and you would like to rehire them during the period of the program, um, there may be a little bit of a disincentive for employees to come back. Um, the, uh, the rules have not eliminated the requirement that uh, employees um, would, would be, uh, you know, had, did, were, were unable to work. Um, and so when, when an application is made, the, uh, the an employee in office will be touching base with, with the employer as normally would be, and there will be an opportunity to contest, uh, contest registrations made by, by employees. Um, the, uh, a couple other, a couple other of the big changes to unemployment, the benefits have been extended by 13 weeks. Uh, independent contractors who ordinarily would not be eligible for unemployment benefits are now going to be, to be eligible to claim benefits. Um, and uh, these, these, uh, these new uh, expanded provisions, particularly for independent contractors, do require that there be some kind of disruption uh, to work, that the reason that the employer contractor is not able to work is related to the COVID-19 um, crisis around the country. Yeah, I, I know a lot of us who have um, lower wage hourly employees say that operate um, the front lines of our convenience stores, uh, that there is that concern about uh, is somebody going to get paid just as well to stay home? And if so, why would they show up and, and come into work? So it sounds like you're anticipating uh, some of that disincentive as well. Yeah, and and as we talk to, to business owners and, and leaders, it's the the communications are important in this in this space i think um you know you have to be really sensitive it's a difficult time for people and and people are um are are you know have concerns um and and businesses can be proactive to address them in ways i think that create the right incentives where we we will have people back to work so that things can get running more on a you know full speed once the once we're able to kind of pull through this uh situation um, and so the one thing to kind of keep in mind as far as the, there's, there's new leave requirements as well um, that were a part of the Families First Act and you know, where employees can, can take leave based on uh, if they've received a recommendation um, that they quarantine or if a family member is, is, requires assistance because of a quarantine um, and in some cases paid leave uh, for employers with fewer than 500 employees. Um, but the, uh, you know, for, in an employer's messaging, you can um, you show them that you've created a, a safe workspace and that you're taking measures to, you know, that you're concerned about about their their health and well-being. Because um, it's the, the rules are different in different states, but in Minnesota, for example, an employee could consider could be deemed a, a constructive termination um, if they felt unsafe at their in their workplace due to the um, health and safety conditions. So. If an employer is proactive and, and you can kind of inform your employees about what you're doing about uh, to keep their their workplace safe and, and sanitary, then uh, you know that could go a long way to to making making people feel comfortable to come back. And then you know if there's anyone who's who maybe is trying to claim benefits in bad faith, then uh, you know there's there's information that you have about what you really did to to help your team um, be uh, be able to continue to come, keep coming to work. Um, well, thank you, Ben. Um, I, I know we need to move on here to Daniel and Tate. Um, just, just a quick question, because I know we've got a lot of uh, folks that pay rent, which rent is something that is uh, uh, approved uh, expense under this uh, payment protection program. But we often pay rent to ourselves or shareholders or family members uh, in, in a different company. Is, are there any prohibitions against that kind of rent expense um, counting in the formula? Well, the uh, the there is a requirement that rent be be made under a uh, leasing arrangement that existed as of February fifteenth, twenty twenty. I haven't personally looked at whether the uh, whether there had to be some kind of you know written lease um, or something. So, but but when um, thinking through kind of where we, we talked earlier about being able to prove that you're eligible for forgiveness, uh, being able to provide some kind of documentation about how those, those payments have been made before February 15th will be important. 
Yeah, so it's not so much who they're getting paid to, it's just that we're consistently continuing to pay them as we have before. Yeah, that's right. There isn't a kind of exclusion for affiliated entities or anything in that in that calculus. Okay. Well, Ben, thank you so much for sharing your insight here on this CARES Act. I'm, I'm, I know there's lots of questions that we haven't been able to, to get to here today, but um, I, I will say Ben uh, was, was kind to, um, one, as a public service, get on and then share his knowledge here, but uh, he said that he and Winthrop are very happy to uh, further engage with anybody with questions that you may have, or even if they can be of, of, of help to you, you're certainly free to use your own legal counsel and, and all that. But uh, I'll send out uh, Ben's contact information to everybody. So, um, and I know he's volunteered to, uh, to be able to talk to you, and uh, if, he, if he can help, I know he wants to do that. So, thank you, Ben, very much. Uh, Dan, let's Ab turn um, quickly. Let's turn quickly to you, uh, Dan Pazanski at the U.S. Venture. I, I know one legal consideration that a lot of us uh, petroleum marketers have is our volumes are off and we have commitments with suppliers. And what does that mean for us uh, if, if we're only buying 50% of the fuel that maybe we're contracted or they're force majeure clauses? Weigh in on, on, on issues that you've been wrestling with. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so from my perspective, um, you know, our company, uh, we are, uh, we're in the space. We don't have retail stations that we own or, or, and or operate. We are, you know, our jobber, a wholesale supplier of, of gasoline and other fuel products. Uh, we have a lubricants division, which we have obligations to on the lubricant side. And we also sell tires on a wholesale basis. So we have, you know, a lot of obligations to, you know, you one would look at I think in all the, everybody's space, you know, obligations to your major brand supplier who you're you're obtaining supply from, and then obligations that uh, also retailers uh, who are buying product from you would would have uh, obligations. So I really, it's an interesting concept, force majeure. You know, I think a lot of people get into contracts they review or maybe their attorneys review, and this provision comes up, and it's you know, what does it really mean? If people kind of look over it, you know, it's basically an unforeseeable circumstance that prevents somebody from fulfilling a contract. Um, and, you know, and I think in our world, it's like you mentioned, it's the, can, you know, volume, you know, is there a volume commitment that I have? Is there a product that I need to produce for somebody? Can I, can I give it to them? Um, likewise, it can be for services. You know, do I have to provide a service or someone need to provide a service to me? And will they be able to fulfill this in light of the current times that uh, we are, uh, under. Um, we talked about this. I'm in the study group uh, of attorneys. Uh, we have about eight of us and we had a call the other day and I kind of brought up the fact that I'm been looking at this from our company's perspective. Um, and really the interesting part about this, it depends what shoe the foot or what foot the shoe is on, so to speak, because you know, if one declares force majeure, right? If if I am in that situation declaring that, I am saying to the other party, I cannot perform. Like and so that's that's the one side. So are you are you in a situation where you can't perform, you can't meet your volume commitment, or are you are, are you receiving this notice from another party who says I can't perform and I because I, I for whatever reasons. I think the thing to know about this at a really high level, because it's a very complicated area of the law that doesn't get used a lot just because, let's face it, it's only in a pandemic or act of God or, you know, a really bad situation, is is to look at your contracts and to determine uh, if there's a notice provision. Uh, a lot of contracts have a very strict, quick notice provision that either either party must provide each other. Uh, so that's important. The other part is each party must still make reasonable efforts to try to fulfill the contract. And the case law that's out there that talks about this is really if I, if one is unable to be profitable because of what's going on with the coronavirus, that probably is not a force majeure event. All right. It's more that I simply can't perform. So in a traditional perspective, you know, in the fuel industry, you know, if major uh, oil refineries are, you know, subject to a tornado or blown up or something like that, you can imagine the the, the product of gas um, or, or supply of fuel is is gone, right? And so potentially 
uh, the other party can't perform. In this instance, we have too much gasoline, right? I mean, we have complete demand destruction throughout the United States as a result of this. So it's not a matter of can, can, I, I, can, I cannot perform, it's just a matter of it's not as profitable. So that's the, the issue that's out there. The thing I think that we're seeing in the industry is a lot of folks are wondering about their volume commitments. What is this gonna mean? Is there gonna be shortfall penalties? Um, and really, I think the thing that is coming to the forefront that people need to look at is, is it better to say to the counterparty, I will extend your contract versus, you know, terminating it, right? It's, let's say, you know, you have a five-year commitment, but I can't meet it, you know, in the next six months. Okay, let's give me another six months on the back end of the contract to make it five and a half years uh, to make it up that way. So, uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, you know, on this to, to talk about it just because of time constraints, but, you know, I think the, the description in your contract is important. I know a lot of contracts will talk about acts of God, you know, tornadoes, earthquakes, you know, things like that, but it does not talk about, I would almost be surprised if it talks about a pandemic. And it, it, it's a matter of whether or not that is a foreseeable event, and we need to look at it from that perspective. Likewise, if you're saying to yourself, my contract doesn't have a force majeure clause, there's what is called the common law. The common law also allows a force majeure to occur. It's a different, slightly different set of rules. Um, but I think at the end of the day, uh, force majeure is nearly defined, meaning that you really got a high burden or high hurdle to prove to get there. But at the same time, it's necessary to think to look at it if you're in a situation where you may not be able to meet a commitment or maybe your counterparty may not be able to meet a, meet a commitment. I think these are going to start trickling in more and more. Maybe others have seen it already. Um, and the last thing I would say in this real quick is I read some articles on this in, in the 2008 financial crisis that occurred. Um, efforts to, de uh, to declare force majeure during that time were very difficult to find. Uh, I know that's only one situation. Uh, but, and then there was also a time where there was like a bird flu going on or bird disease. Likewise, force majeure was tough to find. Um, and so I, I, I say it from that perspective is it, it's, it's difficult to, to look at. So entertain any questions. I know we're running out of time and I, I do have a four o'clock meeting coming up soon. So, uh, if any questions that anybody has or the moderator has, I'd be happy to answer those, but that's kind of the, the 101 on force majeure, which we could spend hours talking about, but I think it's a matter of looking at contracts and determining whether or not uh, this is a situation where you want to declare that. Uh, also, last thing I want to say, actually, is the commentary I've been hearing is, you know, you, you, you probably should follow the notice requirements in your contract, but at the same time, if you declare force majeure, it is creating a situation where the you're, you're telling your, your counterparty you can't perform right you know are you putting yourself at risk where they're going to go in a different direction and sell to somebody else or maybe not or find you in breach and so there there is a legal counsel component to this you got to think hard and long before you do declare it so well, dan on this you said it's in, it's important to look at your notice provision and so if i yes my volume's off 50 percent is it just merely Sending a letter to my supplier and stating as much, and, and that's kind of the notice. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, each contract is different how you do it, right? You know, if you need to buy certified mail, whatever. But yeah, each contract is different. And then likewise, even if the contract does not have language in the res on that, you know, you may want to consult with an attorney as to whether or not you have rights outside of the uh, the contract to still declare that. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting issue for sure. The optimist in me likes to think that all the majors are having this issue, at least on fuel volume, with, with their customers uh, across the nation. So um, reasonable people are going yeah. to have to get together and develop reasonable solutions. But, um, that, that, that's the optimist in me. I, I, I hope that's the case. But uh, certainly something for all of us to keep in mind um, as we're moving forward. So, Dan, thank you for for sharing that. Yep. Tate, Tate Seidman at uh, Pikes Wholesale. Um, 
share with us a little bit about franchise agreements and, and things we need to keep in mind with uh, any food vendors that we may have? Okay. Yeah, I can I can talk some about that. So we, uh, unlike Dan, we do uh, own and operate convenience stores across several states in the kind of uh, southern region of the country, kind of along the Gulf Coast, those states. And uh, one of the things that we do is we operate franchised food service uh, restaurants. And so, uh, as you might imagine, with, with most states, there have been various orders issued by local governments, state governments, and, and federal governments. Sometimes in the beginning of this, a lot of those were conflicting, so we were kind of watching it you know, county by county and, and city by city to figure out what uh, requirements were put in place. I think for the most part, what we found is that we are restricted in those restaurants to uh, offering drive-through service and, and takeout service. So there are a lot of operational issues that come with that. What, what we found on the franchisor side is that a lot of our franchisors are reaching out and, and almost sort of flooding us with information about the CARES Act and, and all the different governmental uh, support services and, and programs that are available to people in our situation. And so we're, we're constantly looking at that and trying to, you know, distinguish between what one franchisor is saying and what another one is saying. Um, and so there's a, there's just a lot of, a lot of different issues that, that, come up when you're dealing with franchisors um, that, you know, kind of have to be, like Dan said, on a, uh, evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis, franchisor by franchisor to figure out, you know, what are they, what is their angle for one? I think some of them, you know, could be angling at uh, wanting to participate in the CARES Act program. So, for example, uh, you know, I guess the, the, the pessimist sort of in me says, well, you know, if a franchisor is wanting to know all of your business about whether you're applying for government grants, are they doing that because they want to see you succeed or are they doing that because they want a piece of the action uh, if, you, if you get any? And so I think that's, that's something that we're looking at uh, closely and, you know, we're not going to let that necessarily affect what we do, but it's certainly something to, to keep in mind as you're considering whether to apply for these different government grants and loans is, you know, who else is going to want to have their hand in your pocket if you're, if you're able to get something from one of these uh, government programs. The other thing that, that we had discussed earlier on was landlord tenant issues. So at a lot of our properties that we own and operate, we have tenants. So, you know, not only our convenience store spaces, but, you know, they may be in more of a shopping center type location where we have two or three tenants attached to our convenience store building. And, and what we're seeing with a lot of those is, um, depending on the industry that that tenant is in, we're getting a lot of requests for rent abatement. We're getting a lot of requests for, uh, you know, just any kind of assistance that we might offer to those tenants. And, and I think, what we have found and, and what I think is one of the better approaches to that is that if you're inclined to grant a rent abatement, one of the one of the better ways to handle that, I think, through, you know, just from an administrative perspective is to you know, grant the rent abatement for whatever period you're willing to grant it. Maybe it's April through June of 2020. And then rather than extend the term of the lease, just have it set up so that the sum of the rent abated during that period is paid back in equal installments during the year of 2021. So that it's, you know, you, you can do that with a really short amendment to the lease. So practically speaking, it makes the process a lot easier because you can just have a, a short amendment that says the landlord agrees to abate the rent from the period of April through June of 2020. And the total amount of rent abated during that period will be paid back in equal installments during the year 2021. And that kind of makes it easier to do than tacking on, 
you know, three months to the end of the term of the lease when you may also be dealing with extension options. So then you have to extend all those extension options. And, you know, I think just administratively, it's, it's an easier way to handle it than trying to revamp the entire lease to, to fit this rent abatement scenario. Well, thank you, Tate. Yeah, that, that rent abatement requests are certainly flooding in, it feels like, for, for us that are landlords. And Ben Clawson, if you're still on the, the call here, a question that came up uh, is, if I am a landlord and I'm getting all these rent abatement requests, is there any assistance in any of these programs to, to help recover um, forgiven rent? Uh, not, uh, not directly. Um, you know, there's, there's assistance on the, to the extent that, you know, most landlords have a mortgage, um, you know, there's, uh, existing SBA loans have a six month period where the SBA will actually make payments on behalf of borrowers. And then there's kind of prohibitions on foreclosures, but, but yeah, there's a little bit less attention for, for landlords in the legislation so far. Okay. That, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, they've been more focused not on the landlords, but on the, the employees at this point. Well, Ben, uh, Dan, and Tate, I really appreciate uh, everything um, that you've shared here today, the audience for being on the call. And uh, as we all respond to this together, we'll, we'll keep sharing ideas as uh, the best we can. And I will get you um, the recording and, and these slides here, as well as Ben's contact information, should you like to uh, follow up with individual questions to him. Wish you guys all a, a great day. Stay healthy. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks.